It's been a busy week in Ottawa, including our finance minister throwing out some new fiscal updates for us. Where are we headed in Canada, right? So we are joined today by one of our regular BCN contributors, Brian Lilly. Good to have you on again, Brian. Um, Finance Minister Bill Morneau, he's uh, apparently open to a change in the Fiscal Stabilization Fund. Tell us about that. Well, this is the, the, the fund that, if you remember the Premier's meeting that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, they all came together in Mississauga, just outside of Toronto, and it was uh, Ontario Premier Doug's Ford's attempt to bring everyone together in cool jets. You know, you, we had a lot of talk of Western alienation. We had the block in Quebec. We had people angry at each other. And Ford said, hey, why don't we have a family meeting? And the Western premiers in particular, but also Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, because they're an oil province as well, they said, you know what? We need a fix to this fiscal stabilization fund. It's not equalization. It's a different fund, and it's supposed to be there. It's supposed to be for when you have a sudden drop in you know, government revenues. It's supposed to be more nimble than equalization. And they all got together in the room, and every premier said, yep, we're going to back this. They couldn't get an agreement on changing equalization, which I know both Alberta Premier Jason Kenney and Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe would like, but they, they all said, this is the right thing to do. We hadn't really heard from the feds on this. And then Bill Morneau on, on Monday does his fiscal update and says, you know what? I'm willing to talk about this. This could be upwards uh, more than $2 billion uh, for the province of Alberta if they get everything they want. I don't know that they will. Um, you know, I, I think the number is about $2.8 billion is what they want. We're probably looking at below two, but more than one. Uh, is my guess of what the feds will offer, but they will offer something is is my you know the fact that they're even talking publicly about being open to this has to be a good sign. They just haven't committed yet. They're dating, but they haven't agreed to get married yet to the issue. <laughs> well, that's very good news if they follow through on that. Any uh, a timeline on that ballpark as to when uh, they'll maybe uh, make a decision on uh, where to go with that? I would suspect that we're looking at uh, the budget, which is somewhere between the very end of February and the early weeks of April. That's the normal time frame for a budget. I, you know, I don't remember one before Valentine's Day, and I don't remember one falling too far beyond, uh, you know, maybe one or two that went past middle of April. So we've got about a five to six week window just around the end of winter where you can expect that they will bring forward the federal budget. My guess is there's going to be a nugget in there that says, here's what you're getting, here's what we can afford, and here's how we'll do it. Okay, well, we'll take what we can get, right? In Alberta, we need it. Uh, <laughs> Morneau also releasing his fall fiscal update, as you mentioned. Now, he did this outside of Parliament, which is uh, maybe perhaps a mild controversy, but uh, the main issue here, you know, where are the deficits heading? Yeah, and, and the reason it's, you know that's a mild controversy is that you normally update the House of Commons on the fiscal situation of the country when they're sitting. But the MPs all went home last week. They they went to back to the House of Commons. I don't want to say they went back to work for a week and a half. They were back in the Commons for a week and a half. They're still working, most of them. Uh, but you don't see this often. Budgets and fiscal updates are done when the legislature is sitting. Ontario did this outside a budget outside of the, the provincial parliament once, they went to an auto parts plant and released the budget. And that was a huge controversy. It hurt the government. I don't think this will to the same degree, but it shouldn't be something that you want to emulate. Uh, bottom line is deficits are going up, but we knew that because the liberals said, you know, forget about that promise we made in the last election of three small deficits of $10 billion. They'd already punted that well down. Uh, and, and they've gone to but, uh, deficits of $30 billion a year. Well, after the but deficit's going down, we're heading back up towards the 25, 27, 30 billion for the next few years. When will the deficit spending end? Don't ask. Uh, uh, you know, some fi financial department uh, figures say that we're looking at about 2050, which is a bit crazy because in his fiscal update, Bill Morneau said the economy of Canada as a whole is strong. The economy is growing. Well, if that's the case, why do you still need to do st stimulus spending? The theory is governments do stimulus spending in bad times. They save up in good times so that they have money for the bad times. These guys are just doing stimulus spending all the time. As for the, the future of the Canadian economy being strong, there's a lot of warning signs, including the International Monetary Fund setting the the global economy is going to slow, in particular, 
the United States and China, those are our two biggest trading partners. That's something we have to be concerned about. Absolutely. I'm glad Morneau is not doing my finances. Wow. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Brian, you had a chance to speak with uh, Premier Doug Ford actually uh, today. So. Uh, uh, can you give us any inside stuff here? I know he's uh, got a lot in his plate here, in particular guns and gangs. That's been an issue in Toronto. Uh, has he said anything on uh, where that's going? Well, you, you know, he's, he's still feeling pretty good about that uh, meeting that we talked about where he brought all the premiers together, and he was quite pleased to talk about that. But the, the most interesting part, and what I've been writing about in the Toronto Sun, is this uh, his response on guns and gangs, because we were asking him about specifically about the city of Toronto. Um, but of course, this is a problem in Ottawa. This is a problem in smaller cities like Thunder Bay. This is a problem in cities across the country. What do you do with guns and gangs? And of course, the liberal response is they have just said in the mandate letter to Public Safety Minister Bill Blair, we're going to bring in a uh, handgun ban through the provinces to allow cities to ban handguns, and we're going to take away what are called military-style assault rifles. Of course, they haven't defined what that is, and there's some very popular rifles there. They're talking about buying back 250,000 rifles at a cost of $600 million. So I said to Doug Ford, they're going to spend twice as much on buying back guns from licensed legal gun owners as they will on... Uh, fighting guns and gangs. You know, it's 300 million over five years. I said, what could you do to fight guns and gangs with that 600 million? And he talked about a, a whole myriad of things from job training to better policing to beefing up the court system so that the revolving door of bail doesn't continue. And then he started talking about affordable housing. And I found that really interesting. It's not what you'd expect from you know, the uh, public image of Doug Ford, the stereotype of Doug Ford. But he said, look, we need to give people better economic opportunities so that they're not getting into gangs. And I could do a lot better things with this money than buy back guns from legal gun owners. Ford, along with Kenny, uh, I'm trying to remember all the premiers I talked to, but uh, it was definitely Ford, Kenny, and Mo all said they won't be participating in any federal attempt at a, a handgun ban for municipalities. They're just not going to participate because they say that's not the issue. The handguns being used in crime are the ones smuggled in from across the border. Exactly. It's a little bit like, you know, saying to doctors, we have an opioid problem, so we're going to take away your, your drugs from, from the doctors. You, you yeah. know, really? Uh, I mean, the good guys, you know, are, are, aren't going around shooting people, you know, so uh, it's not going to be... And the ones helpful. that are, you deal with in the courts. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just a waste, uh, to, to me anyway, a waste of money. I'm speaking, I guess, on behalf of gun owners everywhere. Uh, all right. All um, right. Now, Brian, we spent a lot of time speaking about uh, the SNC-Lavalin scandal over the last year, and news this week that one of the backroom players in that scandal is not being demoted, like, like you'd think, but in fact promoted uh, to a big job in Bill Morneau's office. So uh, tell us about that. Yeah, this comes on the heels of a former SNC-Lavalin uh, executive being convicted of bribery and corruption charges. Strangely enough, in you know, Jody Wilson-Raybould, the former attorney general that stepped out of cabinet over this whole scandal, tweeted out stories about that over the weekend. I found that interesting. But the fellow that was in Justin Trudeau's office that was putting the pressure on Jody Wilson-Raybould to give that deal, one of them is a guy named Elder Marquez. And you might think that with all the trouble he caused the government, they might say, you know what, um, great job, thank you very much, but you caused us a lot of headaches. Uh, here's a parting gift, rice a -roni, the San Francisco treat, pick it up on your way out the door. No, he's getting a, a promotion. He's going to become the chief of staff to the Minister of Finance, the second most powerful cabinet minister in the federal government. And he, you know, as chief of staff, he's effectively running the whole office. So this is not a, a demotion of any sort. This is a promotion. Well, you know, it sends a signal. Perhaps they're thinking we didn't do anything wrong as the Liberal Party as a whole. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, what else can you say about that, right? It, it does send a message. On the other, fla on the other side, hand of uh, the, or the flip side, the Conservative Party, <laughs> they have their issues too here. It, we, we kind of a weird tendency to eat their own, right? Uh, let, let's see, uh, let's recap this last week here. Fire the party's executive director, uh, maybe blame Shears leaving on school fees being paid with party donations and make it look really bad for Andrew that he was doing something devious here. Uh, you know, <laughs> 
I, it just doesn't hit me the right way here. Um, man, do, do we... Really? I mean, I mean, this is not uncommon, is it, for, for uh, again, to be paying the well, difference between, you know, what it would cost to send your kid to a, a Catholic private school in Regina compared to what it's, you know, costs in Ottawa? Yeah, look, it's, that's up for the Conservative Party to decide if that's the right thing. But the, the idea that party leaders get top-ups or they get certain things that they want paid for by the party, which means donations from members, is not crazy. You know, one of the people on the board uh, of the Conservative Party of Canada Fund that said, is said to be incensed by this is a guy named Stephen Joseph Harper, former prime minister. You might recall that he had a stylist, uh, an image consultant and psychic who was initially on the public payroll. And then when that became a controversy, she was moved over to the party payroll. This is a woman who would go around and pick up Stephen Harper's suits and apply makeup before television interviews or uh, appearances where he might need makeup, um, fix his hair, that sort of thing. Why was that, you know, it, someone's specific job and why was it being paid for by the party? That, it, it seems a bit odd. Most of us can pick out our own clothes in the morning. So Stephen Harper's incensed that, at this and he's still justifying and so are his supporters what was done before. It, it's up to the party. And if one's right, then they're both right. But you can't be holier than thou on this. As for the school fees, I, I do want to point out, I know this specific Catholic school in Ottawa. You could have, you know, I was surprised when I found out during the campaign that Andrew Shear did not send his children to the local Catholic school because it's a pretty good one. But he had decided to send them to this private one. Like many religious schools, it's not a highfalutin, high-paying, $20,000 a year per student uh, situation. I've, I've seen some claims of that, which would mean that the uh, Conservative Party could have been paying 20 grand a kid. Well, they weren't. They were paying the difference in the fees between the private Catholic school he sent the kids to in Regina and the private Catholic school he sent the kids to in Ottawa. Um, what that is, I couldn't tell you. I'd be shocked if it's more than two, three thousand dollars a year. And, and is that something that you're going to? Uh, you know, fire the executive director over it. It's not the reason that Sheer left, I'll guarantee you that, but it is the reason they fired their executive director. It's the reason they're having a public fight that makes the whole party look bad. It makes them look like they can't get their own house in order. So if you can't do that, how are you gonna govern the country? Yeah. It's a silly fight for the party to be having yeah. in public, but they seem to be enjoying it. Yeah, somebody needs to, you know, give their head a shake here. Yeah, it looks very, very amateur. Now, uh, Brian, there's going to be a leadership contest coming up, uh, well, in the not too distant future here. Let me uh, give you a couple of names, and then you give me a, a quick description of uh, who this person is and their status uh, in this upcoming race. Ron Ambrose, uh, former cabinet minister under Stephen Harper, former interim leader after Harper stepped down, now living out in Calgary, may not be interested uh, in the leadership. Newly married, and, you know... She's under pressure, but hasn't said yes. She also hasn't said no yet, so stay tuned. Yeah, uh, she seems like the early front runner. So uh, Peter McKay, of course, um, <laughs> no commitment there just yet either, but uh, he's long yeah. been, uh, I think, looking for, for, for such a, a gig, right? A former leader of the Progressive Conservative Party when he merged that party with Stephen Harper's Canadian Alliance, deputy leader of, of sorts for the longest time, senior cabinet minister, uh, originally from Nova Scotia, represented that area for a long time, now making lots of money on Bay Street in Toronto. And he's also in his mid-50s with three young kids at home. So is now the right time for him? A lot of this is going to come down to do people want it? Is it right for the where they are at this stage in life? All right. Aaron O'Toole, he had a good leadership run uh, last time around. Yeah, he finished third. Aaron O'Toole... Uh, he was first elected in, I believe, in the, uh, the, the 2011 election, or, or maybe shortly before that in a by-election. And he was uh, at one point Minister of Veterans Affairs, um, you know, well-respected within uh, the military and the veterans community. He's a veteran himself. He is from the Toronto area. Uh, Durham is his riding. It's near Oshawa, the, the G famous GM assembly plant that's now closing. Uh, he um, was said to be you know, looking at not running if Peter McKay ran, now he's in regardless of whether McKay runs. So uh, they draw from some of the same base of supporters within the party and from party operatives. 
So we'll see what that, that means for the future of the race. For sure. Okay. Pierre Polyev. Pierre Polyev is a longtime MP. He was first elected in 2004. He was one of the 24, 25 year olds. Uh, there was a group of them. Andrew Shear was another. They were first elected as young bucks, uh, surprise, both of them knocking off giants back in the day. And he was a parliamentary secretary and then cabinet minister under Stephen Harper. He's performed very well as the Conservative Party's finance critic, getting under Bill Morneau's skin with some tough questions. He is definitely in at this point. So, oh, okay. is, so is O'Toole, by the way. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, they, they are sharp guys, uh, you know, so that'll be an interesting race for sure. I'm out of time. I wanted to throw some more names by here, but uh, uh, thanks so much, uh, Brian, as always. Your entertaining look at things. Thank you. All right, Brian Lilly, one of our regular BCN political contributors. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thank you so much for watching today.